Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? I am really nervous to make this video. I have no idea why. You would think out of all the videos that I make talking about so many people on this channel that there will be many other videos that I would be nervous about making. But for some reason, this video about Go Ask Alice is the video that's making me nervous. And I have no idea why. I Literally, I have no idea why I'm nervous about making this video. So yes, today is the day. It is the, the long-awaited video about the truth about the book, Go Ask Alice. Now, I, you might be asking yourself, the long-awaited video. I have teased this video out for so long now, okay? I have teased this video out probably for, I don't know, two and a half months or something like that, that I was gonna make a video about the truth about Go Ask Alice. Okay, so a couple of months ago, I decided that I wanted to start making videos about other things. Um, I'm gonna do true crime. I said that I was gonna come out and do true crime and I'm still doing that. I've been outlining many videos. There's, I'm trying to find a specific way <clears throat> that I wanna do it, that is true to who I am, um, but still getting excited about talking about the stories and bringing the truth out and honoring the victim. So I'm kind of outlining several videos right now. Um, and it, my past couple of videos, people gave me some suggestions for stories that they wanted to hear. So the true crime is still coming. But I also said that I wanted to do some videos and um, about like nostalgic things, things that I grew up in, going back and looking at them now and seeing what's come out about them. <clears throat> And I have a whole list of all nostalgia videos. I have things about like the Farrah Fawcett Glamour Center, which was her face and her hair that I always wanted. And my kindergarten teacher, um, she let me go into the back part of the kindergarten class. Um, I, I still, to this day, I think what an amazing teacher she was, you know? And so th during show and tell, you know, people would bring things in like toys. Do they still do show and tell? I don't know if they still do show and tell. But when I was in kindergarten, we did something called show and tell, which is where you brought in a toy and then you showed it. And um, I remember there was this girl in my kindergarten class. Her name was Stacy. I still remember her to this day. And two things that she had that I wanted to play with um, was this Cher Barbie doll that had real long hair. And then the Farrah Fawcett glamour center which was like just you guys remember where they just had the head and you could do its hair and makeup and things like that and so um i think the teacher talked to like my parents or stacy and her parents or something i can't remember but anyway <clears throat> and ask if I could like play with them, you know, in the back room during nap time. So while everybody else was taking nap time, my kindergarten teacher was sitting back there and I got to play with Farrah's Glamour Center and um, I got to play with uh, Stacy's Cher doll. <clears throat> and I was so excited. So like recently, I went back and I was looking at things like the, uh, the the Glamour Center, the Easy Bake Oven. There's been a lot of recalls on these toys through the years and kind of the story behind them and why they got canceled and things like that is really interesting. And also, there's a lot to do with TV shows that I grew up with like Fantasy Island and Love Boat, Charlie's Angels, that there's like all this history to that I was completely unaware of when I was watching those shows and I grew up on those shows. And so I thought, well, those would be kind of fun videos to do. And then there's movies that I want to talk about as well. Like the things that I Google search while I'm just like sitting around thinking all day long are things that I thought you should start making videos about this. Like what happened to the entire cast of Paris is Burning? Where are they today? Sadly, they have almost all passed away. So, um, but that was a video that I wanted to make. And then the other night I was watching the movie Aaron Brockovich, one of my favorite movies of life. And in there I was, this is, this is how I work to think about <laughs> what videos I'm gonna make. But then I think nobody's gonna be interested in watching these videos, right? And so I was thinking to myself, what happened to Aaron Brockovich's, bo Aaron Brockovich's boyfriend, George, in the movie? And so I started, like, Google searching what happened to him. And Aaron Brockovich's boyfriend, George, and her ex-husband um, tried to uh, steal money from Aaron Brockovich. And, <clears throat> I mean, it's this huge sting operation that happened. And so I was like, well, that would make an interesting video. But several months ago... I was just like, you know how I just throw things out in my videos, and I just kind of threw something out about Go Ask Alice in my video and how I loved that book when I was growing up, and um, somebody, it was like one comment that I got, and somebody said, did you know that, the, and I, I have no idea who you are, but thank you so much for bringing it to my attention because I had no idea. Somebody said, did, were you aware, I think it was when we were in Florida, somebody said, um, are you aware that Go Ask Alice is a lie and it was actually propaganda from the Mormon church? And I was like, this can't be true. Like, what is going on here, right? So if you guys don't know the book Go Ask Alice, go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read an article in here from Esquire because I think it does a fantastic job of covering all this information. And I'm just going to kind of go through it. I will link the article 
in the description box below. You guys can go read the article because I'm just going to kind of skim some parts. But anyway, Go Ask Alice was this book of many books, like Jay's Journal, and um, there were there were like five or six of them, and they were books about, um, like they were unfinished, uh, I can't speak, unfinished diaries, okay? And so, like for example, Go Ask Alice was the first of those, and Go Ask Alice was like a found diary of this girl that had allegedly, you think, passed away, right? And it had something to do with drugs, and it was kind of about her descent into addiction and things like that, right? And so it was a literal journal. Like it started, you know, like had the date on it and you would go through. It was journal entries. It was a diary. It was just somebody's diary. And then out of nowhere, it just stops. And then at the end of it, it just is like, I think it says something at the end of um, Go Ask Alice about that it was found after she died or something like that. And so it was supposed to be this story about this girl, like in her own time, that, um, she really, you know, like, fell into addiction and things like that, and then it took over her life, and she was, like, this really sweet girl and whatever. And there was a movie that came out about it afterwards. I actually didn't see the movie until probably, like, I was, like, so... I got So I got sober December 17th of 1994. I don't think I watched that movie... Maybe my friends and I did in high school. I don't really remember. I remember... Like, I still to this day can, like, remember the movie, and she's in this closet, and she can't get out, and she's on this babysitting job and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, what was weird about the book, and looking back on it now and knowing that it's a lie, is that I think it must be, for my generation, what it was like for people that heard War of the Worlds on the radio and really thought, like by Orson Welles, if you guys know the story I'm talking about, War of the Worlds was originally a radio show uh, directed by Orson Welles, where <clears throat> people were listening to it on the radio, and they really thought that the world was being invaded by aliens, and I think that it has, it has to be kind of similar to that because when my friends and I passed this book around and read it, <clears throat> we really believed it was a girl's journal or a girl's diary that had died from addiction. Like, we really believed that. And, you know, I, I think back on the, my, my parents were never, you know, parents that censored what I read. They let me read whatever I wanted to read and things like that. But many of my friends were, like, their, their parents highly censored what they read and things like that. And I can remember some of the big books that came around, like, when I was, like, in junior high and high school. Well, I can remember, like, Mommy Dearest was huge. And um, that book, I think, came out when I was, like, in early elementary school, because I can remember one of my babysitters reading it. And she, like, hid it until my mom left. And then when my mom came home, she saw it, like, on the kitchen counter. And she, my mom was like, oh, I, I wanted to read that book. And that was before the movie even came out <clears throat> with Faye Dunaway. And then the, the book Wifey with Judy Bloom. Do you guys remember that book, Wifey? I mean, that was like <clears throat> where the woman's like looking out the window. Judy Bloom was known for her children's books, but then she wrote a couple books. I think Forever maybe was that by Judy Bloom, but Judy Bloom wrote this book called Wifey and it was about this woman that was married and she wasn't very happy in her marriage and things like that. And I can just remember this because my friends and I, like, we got this book and we passed it around. It was so, I mean, I look back on what we thought was like so dirty and nasty at the time. And it was like this, this woman and she's like looking out her window at like her neighbor fixing his motorcycle. Do you guys remember this? I don't know how I remember that from this book. But then there were other books that we like passed around. Like uh, I'm With the Band by Pam, Pamela DeBar. I and mean, that was a huge book. She was like on talk shows and all kinds of stuff. Helter Skelter, uh, the Charles Manson book was a huge, huge, huge book when I was growing up. But there were all these books that were kind of like passed around and you weren't really supposed to read them and they were kind of you know known to be like bad books and stuff like that and go ask alice was definitely one of those and now i look back in retrospect you know i'm a i'm a avid reader and i think about the things i read today i'm like go ask alice was like nothing okay for what I read back in the day. I mean, or for what I read now. Like, Go Ask Alice was nothing. So, Go Ask Alice was this international phenomenon. I mean, it really was. It was like a bestseller and all this kind of stuff. So, somebody commented on my video. I just kind of like threw it out there and said something about Go Ask Alice, right? And, um, and there's all these other books that have come out. Like, Jay's Journal is about, I think, a guy that like, each one of the books has something to do about like, a teen problem. Like, one of them, because, like, when I was growing up in high school, satanic cults was a huge deal. Is it today? I don't think we hear much about that. But when I was growing up, um, like, people ask me all the time, they're like, have you watched the documentary series? I've, I've seen almost every true crime documentary series. So when somebody asks me about something, unless it's new in, like, the last year or two, I've seen it. And people are like, have you ever seen Paradise Lost about the West Memphis Three? And I'm like, yeah, I saw it when it came out, like, way back in the day on HBO. 
But like the reason why that case was such a big story at that time was because people really did believe in satanic cults. I mean, I can remember when I was growing up and I was like in elementary school and stuff. We used to have these things that you could get. If somebody else out there rem remembers this, please put it in the comment section below. But in school, like if your household was willing to put, it was a red hand and it was like a paper cutout and you could put a red hand in the window. And that meant, I, I think back on this, like <laughs> anybody could have had that red hand, right? Like that, this could have been like a kidnapper's like easy way. But if somebody had like a red hand in their window, it meant that that was like a safe place that you could come if somebody was getting to you. I can remember like having, you know, entire like, you know, uh, what are they back in the day call them POs or what were they? Not POs, <laughs> not probation officers, but um, uh, con uh, conference. What were they called when they would bring us all together? Well, anyway, they would bring us all together and they would convos, convos, and they would talk to us. And I can literally remember us like having to watch film strips about satanic cults and how you had to be really dangerous to not, or it was really dangerous and you shouldn't join a satanic cult and satanic cults were killing kids. And if anybody that was older than you tried to come near you, they were going to sacrifice you. I, I, I remember watching film strips about this stuff right? And so there was like Jay's journal and it was about this kid that like got into some like he fell down the rabbit hole of the occult. I think I did read that one. And then there was one about like teen pregnancy. And then there was another one about there was like five of them. And and they're still they still come out like you can go to the bookstore today and they're like all in a row. Today like I remember the cover of Go Ask Alice like it was like a white cover and it just said like Go Ask Alice on it. Like I think it was in red lettering or something like that. Um, but it was very simple. Today they're all like black and they're like this size and they have kind of like the faded picture of somebody's face on it and then it says like in cursive writing the title of it. So somebody mentioned that to me and they said, did you not know that a Go Ask Alice was Mormon propaganda? And I'm like, oh my God. I, now, I had just finished watching Murder Among the Mormons and I have watched many true crime documentaries and shows about the LDS religion and things like that. And so I was like, this is where, like keep sweet, pray and obey and things like that. And so I was like, this is really interesting. I had no clue about anything to do with this. And so I started reading all these different articles about the truth about Go Ask Alice. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, I had no clue until I was 51, almost 52 years old. I mean, I, okay, so here was the deal, right? When Go Ask Alice came out, and then all the other ones, you know, fell behind that, I think the understanding was always that Go Ask Alice was the true one, right? Like, that was actually a found diary. That there was a girl named Alice, and that Alice, like, had died of an overdose or something like that, or drug addiction, and that the, uh, that, that story was true. The other ones were, we, I think people just kind of assumed that they were all made up off of that first one. That that first idea of this girl's found journal, then there were all these other ones that were made up, and they were made up about any issues that anybody was concerned with at that time, right? Which is why Jay's journal, I think it was called something about Nancy or something like that was the pregnancy one. Um, and, and on and on and on. So, you know, there were all these different ones back then. And um, I think there was one about somebody being kidnapped or something like that. But anyway, so I started reading these articles and I was just like blown away, okay? So the article that I'm going to reference is from Esquire and it's a really, really well done article. Like I said, I'm going to link it below and it's by Jonathan Russell Clark and it was published on July 5th of 2022, okay? And the article is titled, Go Ask Alice is a Lie, but Bookstores Won't Stop Selling It. Okay. So it says on here, 50 years after its publication, this literary fraud about a drug addicted girl is still on the shelves. Can its damaging lies about addiction ever be undone? Now, I just want to tell you what's so funny about this is looking into it. Now, I have my sober t-shirt on today. I thought it would be appropriate to wear for this video. You know, I think about the fact that this was like propaganda. This is so bad, right? And and I've talked so much about addiction on my videos and things like that. And, and I believe that I was born an addict and an alcoholic. My family on both sides is just like riveted with um, uh, addiction. And so I think I was born an addict. But I also believe that addiction can be a learned behavior from people. You know, and I just think that I, you know, had a predisposition for it and was born with it. And then I think the first time that I ever really picked up was like I was off to the races. And there's a lot of addicts and alcoholics that share a similar story to that. I also believe, you know, today in our time with medical prescriptions and things like that, that there is, you know, um, medical uh, driven addiction and things like that, which is a whole other beast of its own. But so there, you know, I, I've talked a lot about addiction on all of my channels. What's interesting about this is somebody that felt full front face front okay into addiction and then got sober when I was 22 and a half 
I think back about this book, and I also think back about, like, Drew Barrymore came out with her book, Little Girl Lost, and it was, like, her biography of talking about, like, going to clubs and the first time she used cocaine. I can remember reading that book and being like, oh, I, I want this life. <laughs> like, I thought, oh, I want this life, right? And then I can remember reading Go Ask Alice, and, like, my friends and I, like, LSD is a huge part of this book, and I can remember... And this guy says some things in here that I think are kind of interesting um, about, and I don't know how old he is, but kind of interesting about his take about, like, drugs and stuff. Because you have to remember that this book was written, I think, like, in the late 60s, early 70s or something like that, maybe middle 70s. And so the time was different then. You know, it's like, I can tell you right now, like, just, and I smoked a lot of weed, okay? I smoked a lot of weed back in the day, like, all day, every day. And today, like, I see these people throwing pictures up on Instagram and stuff where they're holding, like, buds that are, like, this big. I'm like, oh, no, 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 man. Like, we paid $100 for a sack, okay? That was, like, the shittiest, uh, the shittiest Ziploc bag. It wasn't even a Ziploc. It just was, like, a foldover, okay? And then at the very bottom of it was all seeds and stems that would just pop in your face. And you were lucky if you got, like, one little bud that was, like, that small. That's the truth. That's what we smoked back in the day, okay? It was crap. We paid a lot of money for that stuff. You know, drugs are different today than they are than they were when I was growing up and things like that. And so I think it's interesting this, per this perception this author kind of has. And maybe he's my age. I don't know. But my experience with these things is different than kind of like what, what he is talking about in here. I will say that. But going back to the book, what's interesting about knowing now that this book was propaganda is that if the book did anything to me and my girlfriends, it made us more interested in wanting to try these things versus steering us clear of that, right? And maybe the book, because when we read it, would have been the mid to late 80s. Maybe it was a little dated by then, but I still, like, it, it, I don't know. Like, I can remember they played this game, and I think the, the game, he might reference it in here. I don't remember. I, it's been a while since I read the article. But it's called, in the book, it's called something like who's got the who's got the button or who's got the bottom, button, button, who's got the button or whatever. And it's this game they sit in a circle, and, like, one or two of them, it's like they're drinking out of, like, a Coke bottle or something. Some, two people have LSD in their bottles, like liquid LSD, and nobody, and they don't know who it is. And that's that's what sets off go out. That's what sets off Alice into this drug addiction thing, right? Is that her drink is like spiked with LSD and all this kind of stuff. And I can remember my friends and I being like, "Oh my god, like we should play that game." <laughs> like, I mean, that's like not what the book was supposed to do, but like that's what it made us think, right? Probably because we were all a bunch of addicts. But anyway. So he goes in here and says, as a teenager in the late 90s and early 2000s, he talks about his sister in here and how she was struggling with addiction and things like that, right? And then I'm not going to read all that. You guys can go over here and read it. It's a really, it's a really uh, endearing story that he shares in here. During this time, I noticed a book in my sister's stuff, a black cover with only a glimpse of a girl's face. Now, this is a newer edition of the book. And this is not the old one that I remember, okay? As if she were photographed in a dimly lit dungeon and the words go, ask Alice, text wrapping around her eye. I somehow um, ascertained the, okay, so he goes on, the premise of the book. The diary of a young girl grappling with drugs, even by junior high. I had seen enough very special episodes to be cynical and dismissive, but something about Go Ask Alice. Okay, so it goes on to talk about his interest in the book. Um... And it goes on to share his sister's story, whatever. So then this is where it gets into the, the part of the book. Go Ask Alice was published, oh, it was published in 1971. So it was the year before I was born. I was born in 1972. It tells the story of an un, a nun, a nun, not a nun, an unnamed 15-year-old in an unnamed suburb. On July 9th, she attends a party at a popular girl's house. Oh, here it is. And the kids play a version of Button, Button, Who's Got the Button, in which 10 of 14 glasses of Coke are, oh, I thought it was like two. I guess it was 10, are spiked with LSD and no one knows which is which. The ones who drink the unlaced soda, we learn, will babysit the trippers. Alice, as the nameless diarist is often called, does not know about the acid in the Cokes. Unwilling to appear too stupid, she goes along with the game until, having consumed one of the tainted drinks, she starts to feel the effects. Like, I looked at the magazine on the table and I could see it in a hundred inventions and I found the perfect and true original language used by Adam and Eve, but when I tried to explain the words I used, have... do y'all remember your friends who went tripping in high school, okay, and, and being like, oh my god, the devil, I, I saw the devil, truly, I saw the devil, like, came to me and talked to me and spoke to me and told me about my firstborn child and stuff like that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> She comes down after, I'm guessing, a couple hours. The only time reference we get is after what seemed eternities. Learns that she's just tripped on LSD and goes home elated. Okay. So then he goes on here and says, Then literally five days later, this girl who has never tried drugs before, whose first experience with them was LSD, that she wasn't aware she was taking is injecting speed into her arm with a needle. Now, why, when I read this book, 
I didn't think that that was a leap is beyond me. I think I was just so taken. I mean, I think I just believed it was a diary. So I just was like, okay, anything that this girl says is probably the truth, right? She also has tried something called a torpedo, which Google tells me is the mix of marijuana and crack. We used to call those uh, primos back in the day. I guess they call them, do they still call them primos? That's what we used to call them back in the day. Well, not crack, but we would call uh, a joint laced with cocaine primos. But then her grandfather suffers a heart attack, sending Alice into existential crisis, and she vows she won't ever do drugs again. She started like two weeks ago. She Okay, so he's kind of like laughing at the whole story of it, right? She avoids her new druggie friends. Okay, by August 2nd, she sounds like a, a grizzled veteran after her grandmother insists that she get out of the house. She writes, I guess I'll go with... Okay, she wants to, okay. And then she wants to babysit. If, uh, if she wants to trip, she has to go and she has to babysit. But then, of course, she doesn't quit. In fact, she drops acid that very night and even has sex for the first time, too. By October 17th, she's dating an older dealer who restocks my acid supply and gives me enough grass. And what's so weird about this, especially in 1971, so, like, I graduated in 1990. One of my, I've talked enough about addiction. This isn't, like, ooh, moment, right? But, like, one of my good friends literally sold, like, sheets of acid. It Acid was not expensive. You wouldn't have had to date somebody older to buy acid. And you couldn't take that much acid that it was going to cost. I mean, acid is, I don't know what it is today, but back when I was in high school, and I'm sure in 1971, was a very inexpensive drug. And I've read all the books, the electric Kool-Aid acid test and all that kind of stuff. I've read all those books back in the day. The one by Hunter S. Thompson, what is it? Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I've read all of them. Okay, um... I see him again and selling 10 stamps of LSD to a little kid at the grade school who's not even nine years old, I'm sure. By December 3rd, Alice has run away to San Francisco and tried heroin. The following winter, Alice is dead. Okay, so she was dead. So that's where the book comes from. Um, a couple things. He says, first of all, the idea that someone's gateway drug experience is being unknowingly dosed with LSD is absurd. Well, I don't know that it's absurd that that could have happened. I think it's absurd that that would have happened unless you had this most, um, and this is what he's insinuating, that you have this most amazing trip that you would want to do it again. Right? So, like, if you were shocked out of your system, I think that you would be like, oh, like, that was scary as hell. I don't want to do, I, I don't want to ever do, I don't think that that would be the thing that would be like, okay, now I'm off to the, the races. I'm going to be doing all this kind of stuff left and right. So, he says, if you don't know, if you didn't know you were dropping acid, it would not be a good trip. Well, maybe. I mean, it just depends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and you would probably swear off drugs forever. Secondly, acid doesn't last for a couple hours hanging in your friend's basement. Well, okay. So, this is the one thing, right? I don't, and, and I think, so, uh, he's talking about his sister graduating from high school and he was younger than her. And that would have been late 90s to early 2000s. So, I graduated in 1990. I don't know if acid changed in that 10 years, but... Acid, I would say, at the time that I was in high school, lasted about 10 to 15 hours. So th that's that. And I don't know if anybody else wants to sound off in the comment section and, and show, you, show your drugginess. But that's about what a hit of acid, one hit of acid, would last, and maybe not that long. So the reality that she could have been, like, in her, you know, I mean, and we're also talking about, like, dabber acid, that she could have got just a low amount in her drink and that it would have worn off in, let's say, five, six, seven hours. That could have been the case back then, right? Do I believe it because the book is fake? Absolutely not. <laughs> There's no way Alice would return home later that night. Moreover, her descent into tor torpedo smoking, drug peddling, dealer hanging, runaways happen way, way, way too quickly. Well, um, okay, so, um, my girlfriends that I was all friends with in high school, they met these guys at a gas station, <laughs> okay? They met these two guys. Those two guys were kind of our descent into addiction, and they wanted to date those two guys. In fact, two of my girlfriends did date those guys, and they went to a different high school than us, and that was kind of the beginning of the end for us, and that was kind of, I, now, I started drinking long before that. I started drinking when I was 12 years old in my room by myself, but that, the drug stuff, that was definitely the beginning of it, and I would say like my friends when they started it and met these guys I don't think it's unrealistic to say within three months that they were like pretty heavy drug users at that point you know I don't think that that's unrealistic to say at all um were they like shooting speed and things like that no but we're talking 1990 versus 1971 1971 1972 that stuff was a little bit more rampant you know especially if she's thinking about running away to San Francisco and things like that um so I mean given the culture of the time could it have been true maybe he goes on to say, for a teenager like my sister who sought 
um, commensurate com camaraderie, authenticity was the whole game, even though she suspected the publishers may have elaborated on the true story. Does the narrative recounted above sound like the story of a real teenage girl? Well, this is what's so weird about it, is that I never even questioned it until somebody commented it on my video. I thought the other books were fake, but I would have sworn on a deck of $100 bills that Go Ask Alice was 100% the truth. I mean, until earlier this year. To answer these questions, enter Rick Emerson's Unmask Alice, LSD, Satanic Panic, and the Imposter Behind the World's Most Notorious Diaries, a fascinating new book. I'm going to read this book. I am going to read this book. That exposes the fraudulence behind Go Ask Alice and Jay's, Jay's Journal, another real diary about a kid who succumbs to witchcraft. Emerson's, sub uh, subjects, uh, Emerson's subject is the person behind these books, Beatrice Sparks. You may recognize the name if you've read Jay's Journal, even though the author is anonymous. Oh, that's all these books were always by anonymous. It was edited by Dr. Beatrice Sparks, who was discovered Go Ask Alice. Now, this was at the time where I'm reading this, and I'm like, what now? Who does she, she do what, girl? Who is Go Ask? Who is Beatrice? Is Beatrice Alice? Was, now, I'm thinking, is this Beatrice's diary? Was she the one that, do you guys, if you ever saw the movie, it's this girl and she's in this closet when she's babysitting and she takes all this acid and the baby's like crying out in the other room and she's like, bang, she can't get out of the closet and things like that, right? Okay. So who was Beatrice Sparks, he asks. According to Emerson, she wasn't a doctor or an editor, but rather an enterprising writer and member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from rural Utah. Born in 1917, Sparks, born Matthews, dropped out of school at 17 and headed for San Francisco. So she got a little bit of history of knowing what she's talking about here, I guess. In California, she met Lavorne Sparks, married him six weeks later, and eventually had two children with him. The couple moved to Texas, where Lavorne opened a dry cleaning business while Beatrice stayed home with the children and began to try her hand at writing. She wanted to be a novelist. See, she did, girl. Okay, Lavorne got lucky investing in oil, and the Sparks family found financial stability. I'll throw up a picture of her somewhere here. Okay, in Emerson intertwines the story of Beatrice Sparks with brief forays into the history of LSD, Nixon's war on drugs, and later the satanic panic. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning of this video, okay? The satanic cult. So I still, to this day, I do not believe that they, uh, they sacrifice any children in the United States. But that was probably, like, my biggest fear growing up. I was like, oh my god, they're gonna, some satanic cult's gonna get me and they're gonna, they're gonna sacrifice me for the devil and things like that. I was really scared of that when I was a kid because they, like, beat it into our head, right? As, Spark, as Sparks vies for whatever writing opportunity she can, including writing an advice column in a Joseph Barbara comic book, during which she received more letters. Okay, so we learn about the fate of broadcaster Art Linkletter's daughter, Diane, who jumped out of a window to her death. Convinced it was LSD's fault, she told the last person to see her alive that she'd taken some. Linkletter went on a public campaign against drugs, including meeting with Richard Nixon. But because no LSD was found in her system... The autopsy didn't check for it. Okay, now this is... Oh, wait, wait, let's go on. Linklater came to believe that his daughter was having involuntary flashbacks and that it was in one of these flashbacks that she killed herself. Okay, so during this long period of time was when people would come out and say things like, you cannot test for LSD in a drug screen unless you get a spinal tap. Did y'all ever hear that before? That's absolutely 100% false. I just want to tell you that. As somebody that has been sober for over 29 years and worked in a treatment facility for 13 years, I'm telling you that is absolutely false. You can test for anything in a urine drug screen. Anything. You have to specifically test for that thing. But you can test for somebody like huffing something and they can tell you like what it was. They can tell you if it was Febreze and what scent it was. So that is completely false when people say that, okay? The other thing is, in hair samples and blood samples, they can test for things as well. But in a urine drug screen, not one maybe that you buy at CVS, but if you go to a lab and have it done and you say, I want, it, I want this tested for A, B, and C, they can test for anything. They can test for anything, right? But at that time, that was kind of the thing. Like, autopsies wouldn't look for LSD. It wouldn't, like, come right up on a drug screen. It wasn't, like, a, a, on a main panel of a drug screen where they would test for, like, cannabis, opiates, things like that, alcohol. It wouldn't have just shown up, right? Like, you would have specifically had to test for that. So that all, that came out of that, which I think is interesting that like that whole, I can remember that for years and years and years, people would say that, well, you can't test for LSD. And that was actually why like a lot of addicts that were on um, probation and parole and things like that, that they would use LSD because they thought that they could pass a urine drug screens with probation, which in the early days they could because probation officers and things like that wouldn't specifically look for those things. Okay. Um, and Linkletter, in addition to being the genial host of People Are Funny, which became an inspiration for Kids Say the Darndest Things, endorsed numerous products with this, which is celebrity, including the Family Achievement Institute, a multi-level marketing scheme involving vinyl albums, uh, parenting advice, uplifting stories, and bland spiritual wisdom. Sparks was hired to write some of these pieces, and even though 
Um, the family, whatever this is called, Achievement Institute was a colossal flop. She now had it in with Linkletter, who was influential and involved in myriad business interests. Shortly after the death of his daughter, it was to Linkletter that sparked pitcher idea for what eventually became Go Ask Alice. She signed with Linkletter's literary agency, and the book was sold to Prentice Hall. She was 53 years old. This is going to stop. Hold on just a second. I mean, we are just getting into it. Okay. So, when, um, so he goes on here to talk about his sister and what she thought about the book and all this kind of stuff and compares it to, um, Chuck Palahniuk's diary. Okay. So, um, little is known about the source material behind Go Ask Alice. Let me adjust this really quick. We're professionals over here, you know? Okay, little is known behind, about the source material behind Go Ask Alice. Sparks' own account of obtaining the diary, according to Emerson, changed with every telling. <laughs> Emerson provides a probable inspiration. A young girl staying at a Mormon summer camp at Brigham Young University. Oh, because this woman was a camp counselor. Okay, Sparks had a long history of presenting herself as a psychology or youth counselor, though she had no degree or license. Despite this, her unverified claims were printed in numerous stories about her. A worried counselor in the camp, uh, camp called Sparks when a a girl Emerson called Brenda, she doesn't want her real name printed, suffered a breakdown. Sparks, Emerson suggests, spoke to the girl and then kept up with her for some time afterward. The story behind Jay's journal is much clearer and more, much more horrific. Alden Barrett was a smart but difficult kid raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah. He struggled with depression, didn't fit in his conservative community, and stole pills from his father. Perpetually at odds with his parents, Barrett briefly ran away from home to San Francisco, just like Sparks and Alice. Everybody's going to San Francisco. I want to go to San Francisco. I've been. I don't love San Francisco. I have to be honest with you. It's not one of my favorite cities. But before returning home and trying to kick the drugs, after a relapse led to an arrest, Barrett met and fell in love with Teresa, a classmate one year older than him. When her parents discover Barrett's lurid past, they force the couple to split, distraught over the breakup and his jealous paranoia that Teresa would get back together with her ex-boyfriend. Oh, my Lord. Then he took his life. Okay. For the last six months of his life, he kept a journal. It contained 60... Oh, I forgot about this. It contained 67 entries. In 1977... This is so shady boots down. Barrett's mother read an interview with Sparks about her role in bringing Go Ask Alice to millions of readers. Barrett's mother sent Sparks a diary, which became Jay's journal. Sparks' version, however, contains 212 entries taking place over 18 months. And worse, suddenly, Barrett, as Jay, isn't merely struggling with mental illness. He's a full-on Satan worshiper, replete with ritual sacrifices, orgies, demons, animal mutilations. I think I might want to read this book again. I got it right down there. And all manner of morbid and melodramatic miscellany. Barrett's diary never mentions any such nonsense, but that didn't stop Sparks from publishing it as the truth, warning parents about the dangers of Satanism. Okay. Then it goes on and says that Go Ask Alice played a part in the disinformation campaign against drugs in the 70s and beyond, and that Jay's journal contributed to the satanic panic of the 80s and incon incontrovertible facts. That they, I need a spelling test for this article. Yes, ma'am. That they are both uh, based on tiny kernels of reality. Okay. Then it goes on. Just read the books. The parts dealing with drugs or witchcraft or other uh, Sparks titles like, Oh, it happened to Nancy or Annie's baby. AIDS and teen pregnancy, respectively. Would be laughable if their consequences weren't so dire. It's hard to believe that anyone bought into this stuff, particularly the press, which welcome. I did. I thought it was the God's holy truth. I really did. Made me, made me want to do drugs. That's so bad, isn't it? A book like all teenagers and parents of teenagers should really read, says the Boston Globe. Had I read Go Ask Alice as a teen, I might have worried myself sick that Sarah was going to sell acid to babies and die in a year. I don't remember being really worried about that because I knew that the book was so old. <laughs> I was like, where can I get my hands on some shit? This is the truth, okay? From an addict having read that book. But that didn't happen. Okay, the books are untrue, and any subtle or subtle, unsubtle hint otherwise is patient is patently dishonest. The copyright page of Go Ask Alice states that it's the work of fiction. How did we all miss that? Whereas Jay's journal, by means of not staking a claim one way or the other, still supports to be true. Go Ask Alice has sold over 5 million copies. Is that it? I think it has probably sold more than that. Well, now you can get it at Goodwill. Meanwhile, Simon & Schuster recently published a 50th anniversary edition in the YA section of Barnes & Noble. You'll find a bunch of Sparks books all designed with similarly sinister covers. The publishers are still profiting from these lies. But it says it's fiction then, I guess. So why is that? Is it, okay. Um, this is why the debate over who gets to tell stories is so vital. Isn't it about limiting the creativity of... Okay. Where does it get into her background history? It's like everything we were ever told turned out to be bullshit, as Sister said. I agree. It's all bullshit. The publishing industry likes to posture at, okay, no tolerance. 
um, regarding dishonesty from writers, but somehow the publisher themselves never seem to take any blame. It goes on to talk about certain books and things like that. Oh, and who can forget James Fry, the author of Million Little Pieces, who sat in front of Oprah millions of years while she lambasted him for embellishing and lying in his memoir. Okay, so let's talk about this book for a second, because I get asked about this book a lot. So... I read Million Little Pieces by James Fry, okay? I can tell you, within, like, having gone through treatment the exact same way that he did on multiple occasions, I can tell you that, like, within the first couple pages of it, I was like, this is a lie. He goes to detox, and at the beginning of detox, he has to be taken out for a dental procedure. That would never happen in detox. They would have fully discharged him and all this kind of stuff. That would never have happened. So when I started reading this book, I knew immediately that it was a, it was a lie. Unlike Augustin Burroughs' Dry, which when you read that book, if you've ever gone through treatment, you're like, yep, this is the real deal. Unlike the book, Blackout, Remembering the Things I Drank to Forget, fantastically done. You're like, yep, if you've ever gone through it, you're like, this is exactly 100% the truth. Like Carolyn Knott's uh, Drinking a Love Story, which changed my life when I got sober. I had such an issue with this book, A uh, Million Little Pieces by James Fry. I don't even think I finished it, if you want to know the truth. Um... And I was so upset with the fact that he got on there and he lied because this was at a time when a lot of people were coming out and doing addiction true, uh, true memoirs, right? And so I took such offense to it. My best friend who is also sober, I remember talking to her about it. She loved it and she also loved the follow-up to it, which is called like My Friend Leonard or something like that. And she was like, you know, if it helps one person, What's the issue with it? And that completely changed my whole perspective about the book. I don't really take an issue with the book today. If he wanted to lie and write a book about it and all that kind of stuff, that's his business, right? And I can tell you there are a lot of people to this day that I meet that they read that book and it really helped them in their early sobriety and they didn't know it was a lie at the time that they read it. So I don't know that I think, you know, what I really think about that, honestly. I, my, I, my opinion has changed greatly about that over the years. Um... So where does it get into all this about... Oh, it doesn't even get into all this. Stories are effective weapons, so are usage. Where is the... Okay, I was um, reading about... The book that defined teen anxiety turned out to be a lie. Maybe this is from electric literature. I read some article, and it was talking about how... Oh, this is another one, talking about my older sister never let me in her room. All these people whose sisters had Go Ask Alice. Oh, is this the original cover of it? This is the... No, it was. It was black and it had her face on it. Why did I... No, maybe that's not the original cover. I don't know. But all these people on here talking about their sisters and all this kind of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, this person's... This article is good. I don't have to read this. Have I read this article? Okay. And then at the age of 47 and a half... Oh, here it is. The article in the, the Parish Review. This is the article that I read. Um, of Go Ask Alice where it talks about... So, this is the deal. Okay? So, this... This... Beatrice Sparks... She was part of the LDS church, and she had been a church, she had been a camp counselor. She wrote these books basically as propaganda to financially benefit of uh, because she couldn't write her own books of her own stories that would get published. So she worked with, within, like, not really with the Mormon church, but as a member of the Mormon church to publish these books basically as propaganda on everything that was bad for teenagers. So Go Ask Alice was never real. It was based off a story she heard from somebody that she kept in contact with at a camp that she was a camp counselor with that never even passed away. She just took her story and turned it into a fictional diary. Jay's journal, which was not had to do with this guy that has depression, she turned it into satanic panic, like about satanic cults, and added over uh, like 100 pages. I think it would say it was 87 pages. It turned out to be 212 pages. Almost 200, 150 pages it turned out to be. And she lied about all these different books. Like it happened to Nancy about HIV and the other one about teen pregnancy. And they were basically just like teen warning books. And we bought into it! And we bought into it! How stupid were we? Oh my god! <laughs> How many more lies are out there in the world? I'm so over it! <laughs> I'm so over it! And Aaron Brockovich's ex-boyfriend and husband tried to get money out of her? Oh my god, because they were going to tell secrets that she was having an affair with that Ed Masry, that attorney that she looked at? I'm so over the world. What has happened to the world? Go Ask Alice is a lie, and I'm devastated. I'm devastated. Anyway, let me know what you think about all that in the comment section below. If you guys any have any requests for videos, put them in the comment section below as well. I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.